it's great to be back and to be uh, with you again. Real pleasure. Great joy to see you these working behind the scenes. How grateful we are for teams of people. Thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, well, yeah, we're looking at the story of Moses. I'm going to be in Exodus in chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. And uh, that's an amazing chapter, actually. It's a chapter of worship and celebration. It's after they've crossed the Red Sea. And uh, you may recall that this people, two million slaves, Jewish people, who have been in captivity for hundreds of years. And God has now done an extraordinary thing. And uh, while they were there, God raised up Moses. God began to change their circumstances. And then, of course, they're making the journey out of Egypt. They're escaping from slavery. And as they encounter the Red Sea, suddenly the way is blocked. And of course, this whole story really is written down, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's written down for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. All right, so it's solid history. It happened to them, but it's written for us. It's written down for us to help us because we're, we're living in a day when people are kind of thrown away the map. They're throwing away the compass, trying to muddle through life, and the world gets more and more confusing. So God has given us a pattern that we can live by. That's what it's written for. We're told that in the New Testament. All these things happen to them for an example for us. They're written down for our instruction, how to live, how to cope with life. And so here they are running away, and suddenly the way is blocked. You can't go any further. We hit times like that. We think, I'm locked in. I can't see my way through. I'm in trouble. And that's what happened to these people. They said, well, how do we get through? Not only can we not get through, but here comes the Egyptian army with chariots and horses, and we're just slaves. We don't have any uh, armor. We don't have anything to protect ourselves. Here comes this great army, and wow, we've lost it. We've had it. And then there comes this wonderful word from God to Moses, stand still and see the salvation of God. It's like, you're my responsibility. I'm looking after you. And then he's told to raise the rod of God, this staff he had, and hold it over the Red Sea. And the Red Sea opens up. It just opens up. And they can go through the sea. You know, the fish are looking through. So what's going on? And they're just walking through. And they're escaping. And here comes the Egyptian army. They say, well, we'll do the same. They pursue, and the sea closes over them, and they're gone. They're just taken away. And you get in Psalm, in Exodus 15, this great song. It's the first, if you like, song of worship in the Bible. We could call it Psalm 1, if you like. Full of worship and praise. And really, it's a bit of a revelation to us, because what is worship? It's a response to a revelation of God. They suddenly see God for all that he is. And the, the outcome of that is just celebrating, worshipping. It's like us this morning, before the throne of God. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. Things you see and understand makes your heart leap for joy. And Moses is saying, who is like you? Just have a look at that psalm. We, we're not going to look at it all now, but it's a wonderful hymn of worship. Who's like you? There's none like you. And then he says, the horse and the rider, you've cast into the sea. They sank like lead. They're just kind of overjoyed. It's a song of tremendous joy. They're worshiping and dancing and singing and praising. You think, wow, what a, what a wonderful conclusion to their experience of being slaves all these years. It's all over. Now they're full of joy and liberty. And then you read... When I was writing this book that we've, we've been working on, and I just recommend the book to you again. Uh, still more copies if you want one. I was writing the book and thinking, yeah, well, that's a wonderful psalm. That's a wonderful chapter. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, that's not the end of the chapter. I thought, oh, blow, surely, surely that, that's, that's a wonderful section, that song. But stuck on the end of it is something we didn't anticipate. I'm just going to read it with you. Exodus 15 from verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they couldn't drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses. What should we drink? Then they cried out. He cried out to the Lord. 
And the Lord showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters. And the waters became sweet. Father, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for the joy of celebrating our lion, our lamb, our mighty saviour. We thank you for your being with us. Holy Spirit, we invite you now, please, come and be our teacher. Come and make these stories relevant to us, we pray. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here come these people. Out of Egypt, I've called my son, the Bible says. This, these two million people, they're like a new creation of God. They've come out. They've been like through the sea and out the other side. They're, they're like born again people. They're starting on a new journey. And then to our surprise, we hear, read these words, they were led into the wilderness. You think, what's that all about? Into a wilderness? We don't, weren't expecting a wilderness. It reminds me of another one who was plunged into water in the River Jordan on our behalf, the Lamb of God who takes away all our sin. And, and God said from heaven, this is my son. This is my son. Out of Egypt, I called my son. And what's the next thing? Well, he led him into the wilderness. You know, there's an identification with us here. The journey that we're walking on can have times of wilderness, setback, disappointment, hardship. And here they, they're free, they're no longer slaves, it's great, but we're in a wilderness and there's no water, which I guess for one day, okay, we manage that. I mean, we are free and, and it's all behind us and so there's no water, so there's no water. Day two, I bet a few mums are shouting, what about the kids? There's no water. How are we going to survive? There's no water. We're in trouble, there's no water. And then it comes to the third day. And there's still no water. And I'm sure there's again, there's going to be a scream. Hey, look, this, we're, we've been set free. We're following the cloud. But how do you survive? How do you get through all this? This is, this is bad news. This is tough. I didn't expect it to be tough. We, God's a deliverer. God's a savior. God set me free and he's led me into a wilderness. What's this all about? Now, that can happen to us. That can happen to us. And, well, what's going on here? I know when I got saved, I thought, hey, what's going on when things started going wrong? You see, at first you think it's so exciting. It's so wonderful. And then, you know, you turn up at church and you think, hey, it's great. And the people welcome you. Oh, you've become a Christian. Can we baptize you? Oh, this is wonderful. And then you find a list comes up and your name's forgotten. They left me out. And someone was rude to me in the coffee queue. And I thought, I mean, I thought it would be different. Uh, uh, and then I, I, I just got left behind. I, I think that person was angry with me. I, thought, I didn't expect this. Uh, and then even you can get, I'm still thirsty for the stuff I left behind. That, that's a real shock. When you first become a Christian and you've become new and you think, oh, I know Jesus now. And to your amazement, the stuff back there that you still want. You find that happens in the story of these guys going through the wilderness. They're often thinking back to what they still wanted. They're still tempted to go back. That's a journey that they're still considering. They're thinking, well, should I, should I turn around? Should I go back? And so they, they meet with real disappointment. They're real struggling with it. And you can have all sorts of different ways. One thing you can think is this, shall we go back? And that recurs again and again through the story of the Exodus. Let's go back. And they get these kind of uh, strange ideas. It was wonderful when we were back there. And they get distorted views. Hey, it used to be great back in Egypt. It was never great back there. But they, they, they kind of got it all confused. Let's go back. Or secondly, you can just say, well, let's put up with it. I mean, the cloud is leading us. And we can feel a bit like that. Well, you know, Christianity doesn't really satisfy it's really tough, but, you know, you have to keep going because you're a Christian. And some people have settled for that. We know the language, but you just get on with life. Life's tough, life's difficult. You just have to face it. Become a bit of a stoic, really. Put Christian language on it, but underneath we're just coping. That's another thing we can do. Or we can get bitter. And this is what this story is about. They, they travel three days, but when they get there, it's bitter. You can't drink it. You think, wow, what's going on here? I, 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 I thought this was going to be the provision. And I can't drink it. It's terrible. 
It's bad stuff. I guess when they first heard, you know, two million people on a journey, and I don't know how wide the crowd was or how far back it went, two million people walking, and we run out of water, and you think, hey, there's a news, there's water up ahead. At Mara, there's water. On the third day, I guess it went back through the crowd. There's water up ahead. There's water. Oh, great. There's water up ahead. Then you get there, and it's too bitter to drink. You can't even drink it. Now, hopes raised and then dashed are worse than no hope at all. You can kind of get used to the boredom, but when you think, this could be it, this is it. And it isn't it. You can't drink the stuff. And we hit things like that. You think, I think we found the house we're looking for. I really like it. And, and we both like it. And, I, you know, we're going for it. We think that's it. We're going for it. And then you hit the word, sorry, someone else has bought it. You think, wow, no, that was going to be our house. We just imagine ourselves there. We just imagine seeing the kids in the garden. It's gone. It's gone. That's gone. Or maybe some guy has been chatting to you and making it sound like, hey, this is permanent. We've had a few dates. This is very exciting. Maybe the other way around, the guy has met some beautiful girl, and I think we're, I think we're making progress. This could be the one. This could be it. I'm, we're through. Hey, I've found what I wanted for. I can't imagine my whole life. And then you get the Dear John letter. Sorry, no. You think, oh, good grief. Your heart's raised, and then dash. It's hard. Or maybe the job interview. You know, this COVID thing's been so hard. Jobs lost, money. It's been difficult. And then there's a job on the horizon. You, know, you did the interview. You thought it went well. You thought, hey, this is it. We're through. And then you're told, no, no, sorry. Someone else has got the job. Oh, hopes raised and then dashed. It's very hard. And going on through a wilderness, you think, well, how am I going to cope? How, how am I? I mean, we're free, but we're going to die out here. I remember when I was, when I was converted, I, I, I come from a totally non-Christian background. My parents were not believers. There was no Bible in our home. We didn't pray as a family. I mean, it was all foreign stuff to me. And then I, got, I heard the good news. I, I, I knelt and received Christ. I thought, wow, this is, this is exciting. I, felt like I came to know God. But I'm a teenager, and, and my previous life was very ungodly. And I had lots of friends in that world that I liked a lot. And when I spoke to them about Jesus, they weren't the slightest bit interested. And I was about to lose all my friends and my lifestyle. And, well, I still wanted that. I wanted their friendship. I still wanted that lifestyle. And I started going to church on Sunday morning. I was there virtually every Sunday. I'm in church. But I'm also out partying like I always was. And I, I mean, I'm a totally double life. So Friday night's jazz club, Saturday night I'm up with the guys, we're drinking. I'm drunk most Saturday nights. I mean, that's the way I was. That's my life. And I'm on church on Sunday because I've become a Christian, but I don't, know how to, I don't know how to break off this stuff. I can't step away from it. So I'm living two lives. I'm on the train going to London every day. I'm gambling in the front compartment, hoping no one from church sees me. I'm just living a complete, that's me, that's me. I did that for years, about four years of total mess in church every Sunday. And I'm in church one Sunday, and the guy preached from Galatians, a verse in Galatians that says, you did run well, who's hindered you that you no longer obey the truth? You did run well. And I, I mean, when I started, I was quite excited, but you did run well, who's hindered you? And I sat there, and I, and I was in a, a, quite a big Baptist church in Brighton, probably about 700 people, and, and I felt like I'm the only person there. And I felt God spoke to me. And I first said this, I want your life... I want it now, and I won't speak to you about this again. And it really scared me, especially that last bit. Like, this is, I'm not going to speak to you about this again. Now, I knew I was a Christian. I knew I was a bad Christian. I knew I, knew I belonged because I'm always being told off. Because, you know, every week when the guy preaches, I often feel, yeah, no, no, no. And I felt bad. But no, I'm, I won't speak to you about, I thought, that is very scary if he's not going to speak to me again. I mean, what will I, where will I end up? What's going to become of me? Because I, I know I'm a Christian. I know this is the answer to life. I really believe the stuff, but I, my lifestyle's all out of line. And I'm still thirsty for the old stuff. But I got so scared, I went home from that meeting. 
And I got on my knees. I said, God, okay, I'll give you my life. And I actually went out with all my friends one more weekend. I said, this is the last weekend with you all. And I talked to them about it. They all laughed. Said, You'll be back next week. I said, no, no, I'm going to start living proper Christian. And the next weekend came around. I mean, I lived for the weekends. We all did. My job was boring, boring. And we lived for the weekends. I mean, the weekends. Brighton's a fun town at the weekends. Two universities, young people everywhere. I loved it. I loved it. I loved the bars. I loved the whole thing. And the next Saturday came around. And I got on my motor scooter. I used to drive a scooter. And I drove my scooter down in town. And that Saturday night, and, oh, there's the crowds, the people. I love it. I love this atmosphere. I thought, oh, God. And I went back home. So this happened to me. It's my life. I went home. And, and, and the dark end of town, the hove end of town. And it's kind of, you know, all the fun's down there. And I'm back here. Uh, Saturday night. And I put the motor scooter away, and I go into my house. My parents are in the other room, not Christian, not interested. And I sit in a room, alone, on a Saturday night. And I thought, I'm going to die. <laughs> I mean, I can identify with these guys. Three days in the wilderness, we're going to die. That's exact. I thought, I'm going to die. And the young people used to say, Christianity is life with a capital L. And I used to think, Christianity is hell with a capital H. I'm sitting indoors on Saturday night. I thought, this is, this is terrible. And there's years ahead. I'm at the end of life. I honestly went through, I thought, I'm going to die. How am I going to endure this? And I remember I picked up my Bible, which I'd not done before. And I started reading the book of Acts, which I'd not done before. And as I'm reading it, I can only say this, a kind of bubble of hope came up in my soul. I thought, hey, this is pretty exciting. This is amazing stuff. What happened to these Christians? I mean, prison doors open and thousands become Christians. I found I was, I was kind of caught up with it. And, and God was just giving me a little taste, a tiny taste of the joys that were to come. But for me, it looked so bleak, I'm going to die. And that's what these people thought, we're going to die. And so they got so bitter about it. They, they, I mean, you can't say to God, you're a liar, God. You can't say that. I mean, it's a bit scary to say that. They asked some silly questions this morning, but you can't say to God anything like that. You can't say, hey, I think you're rotten. You, but you can blame the leaders, can't you? Like he said, Moses, they complain to Moses. See, leaders carry a lot of pressure, especially when things are a bit tough. Because they're kind of there, and you can't blame God, but you can blame them. And so, yeah, Moses gets, for the first time, if you like, well, no, actually, not the first time, but right through the story, Moses carries a lot of weight, a lot of burden, the pressure. Leadership's difficult in any world. It's very difficult in church life. You carry a lot of pressure. And so they start moaning. They're bitter. They're bitter at Moses. They think, what on earth are you doing? What do you lead us into this for? You know, this is bad, bad news. What's going to happen to us? And then we see this extraordinary phrase. I don't know if you noticed it when I read it out to you. It says here, the Lord showed him a tree. Now, it doesn't say he saw a tree. Words in the Bible, you take words seriously. The Lord showed him a tree. It's like, it's, the word revelation is a Bible word. It's like God showed him something. He saw this thing. Now, it's a little bit like the stories of Elisha, where Elisha says, I'll throw this into the water, do that, and it will be solved, and so on. So the bitter water, they're told, there's that tree, throw the tree into the water. Now, what does that mean? What's that all about? It's written for our instruction. What's it about? Well, what we're meant to see here is a tree that's referred to in the New Testament. It says about the rock, which later in the story, which they hit and waters came out. Later in the Bible, it says the rock was Christ. So it's kind of figurative here. So here, the tree, let me remind you of some New Testament verses. It says in Acts 5.30, Jesus, whom you killed and hanged on a tree. Acts 10.39, they slew him and hanged him on a tree. Galatians 3.13, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed 
is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, what's that verse? That verse, Galatians, quoting from Deuteronomy 21. In the Old Testament, if someone was a blasphemer, if someone was leading the people astray, they had to punish him, they had to deal with him, and then they had to hang him up on a tree. Why? Because we've done all that we can do as humanity. Now, God, you curse him. We've done what we can do to him. You now do what you have to do to him. Curse him. And cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He stands there to carry the curse for the people. And here, Paul tells us again and again, this Jesus who hung on a tree. And so we're looking here at the cross of Christ. We're looking at this one who hung on a tree, and we have to throw the cross into the bitterness. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this. The application of what happened to Jesus can take the bitterness out of our heart. Now we're told that you have to see it. They, he didn't just start with a tree. The Lord showed him. It has to be revealed to you. Now it says in, in 1 Corinthians, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So we live in a generation that's totally indifferent to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. It's foolishness. Ridiculous. And it says this, the Jews ask for signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews, a stumbling block. What does it mean to Jews, a stumbling block? Well, the Jews were waiting for a Messiah. The Bible promised them a Messiah, a great anointed king, a son of David. Now, what did David do? Well, David was an extraordinary young man. The Spirit of God was on him. Goliath comes strutting out, and David took him out. I said, wow. And he not only takes out Goliath, but he becomes king and has an army. It says, like the army of God, an invincible army that destroyed Philistines. An invincible king, a great, great anointed king. They're looking for a Messiah who will come. A great anointed king who will come. And so when Jesus emerges on the scene and begins preaching and crowds start pursuing him, people begin to wonder and they say, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? You read the Gospels, you'll find out, are you the one? He does amazing miracles. It says the Pharisees sent soldiers to capture him. The soldiers went and they listened to him teach and they came back empty-handed and they said, well, where is it? And no one ever spoke like this man. He speaks with authority. We've never heard a guy speak like that. And he does miracles and healings and wonders. And he begins to gather crowds. It says he could hardly enter towns because crowds were gathering to him. One time he went up a mountain. It says 5,000 pursued him. In the, in the, it says 5,000 men. Then it says plus women and children. Don Carson says probably 20,000 people. So there's, there's uh, Jesus with 20,000. He said he taught them. And he healed them. And then they slept up there. And the second day, he taught them and healed them. And they sleep again. And the third day, it says this, he healed them all. 20,000 people, like a small town or village. 20,000 people, and there's not one sick person among them. God has come down. This is amazing, amazing. Then the disciples say, hey, these guys must be getting hungry. You should send them away. They've been with us for three days. Then Jesus says, you feed them. How can we feed them? Now, he, what have you got? A few loaves and fishes. So he blesses it, breaks it, gives it to them, and they start feeding, feeding, feeding. And 20,000 get fed. And they say, wow, this, this has got to be the Messiah. It's got to be. It says in Deuteronomy 18, 18, it'd be another one like Moses. It'd be like David. It'd be like Moses. And Moses kind of fed them in the wilderness. He just fed 20,000. And it says they tried to make him, take him and make him king. In other words, they tried to impose their agenda on Jesus. You come on, you've got to be our Messiah king. And he withdrew. He took the disciples, pushed them off into a boat. He's not having them impose their agenda on him. He says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and give my life a ransom for many. And that, I mean, the stumbling block for Jews. They're, they're not expecting a Messiah who gets killed. I mean, David doesn't get killed. Goliath does. This guy dies on a cross. That, that this one, 
He's wiped out. I mean, Messiahs don't get wiped out. Romans should get wiped out. And so Jesus is a stumbling block. The holy, holy, holy Son of God dies on a cross. You know, it says in Isaiah, that there's this revelation of Isaiah. He sees his glory. And he says, I'm lamed. I'm undone. The Hebrew word means lamed. It's like I can't walk anymore. I've seen the Lord. He's high and lifted up. And John's Gospel says he saw Jesus. He saw his glory. That's Jesus before his birth as a man. He saw him. This holy, holy, holy one. And that one was smashed to a cross, naked, hanging there. That's a stumbling block. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear that the holy, holy, holy God is a forsaken. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's cursed for us on the cross. He takes away our guilt, our shame. He carries our curse. It's the message that we have to take to the world. But Jews found that a stumbling block. We got well, what a warrior king, not a dead one. This is the gospel that they took out. Jesus, Jesus died to take away our guilt. He died to take away our sin. He died to free us. That's the message. He becomes a king after his resurrection. But that's the message that they took. That's the message that was brought to them. And it was a stumbling block. It's like we don't want that. We don't want to hear that. But you have to take the cross, accept it, and see the amazing thing God's done for us. And if you like, cast it into the bitterness. Because we can have such bitter experiences. Loss. These two years of COVID. Sickness. Loss. Finance. People. Dear ones passed away. You think, this is terrible. But we have to work out our salvation. And we do that by applying the cross. And we have to do it, beloved. We have to do it. You see, you say, well, salvation, well, I was saved on, you know, in 2005. I was saved recently on Alpha. I was saved, that's a past thing. Or one day, I'm going to be saved. When I die, I'll go to be with God, I'll be saved. So we think of salvation past, salvation future, but we have to have salvation present. We're told to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You work it out. For God is at work in us. To will and do is good pleasure. He comes to help us, but we have to apply it. We have to apply it. We have to say, Lord, your cross means everything. Your cross means my guilt's gone. Your cross means you came right down to my world. I ponder that. I run the race set before me. You see, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish people who were tempted to go back. Like these people were tempted. Let's go back. The book of Hebrews is all about that. And so the book of Hebrews is written saying, it's better to go forward. There's an inheritance going forward. You see, Jewish people in the Roman Empire, they were permitted to have their religion. It was an accepted religion in the Roman Empire. They could have their synagogues. It's okay. But Christians, oh no, you're not accepted. Their goods were spoiled. They're in, they're in a vulnerable place. Let's go back and be Jews. Let's go, let's go back. No, no, don't go back, the writer says. Keep pressing on, keep pressing on. Run the race that's set before you, looking to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That's what Hebrews says. It says in chapter 11, we're surrounded by this crowd of witnesses. In the Bible, witnesses are not witnessing, watching us. They are bearing witness. So Hebrews 11, there's Abraham saying, go on, he's faithful. Sarah saying, hey, he did it for me. Moses saying, you can trust him. We're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses saying, you can trust him, you can trust him. Keep running the race. Look to Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Run after him. The course that's led, you see, sometimes you think, well, I'd rather be in her track. No, the track that's set before you. His track looks much nicer. No, the track that's set before you. My track's difficult. No, run the track that's set before you, looking to Jesus. You bring the cross, you apply the cross. I know when this came home to me first in my own life, I was, I was <laughs> and go back to that time when I'd just come really to try and live the whole Christian life properly. And I, I'm trying to do that. And it comes around to our first kind of holiday vacation time. I think, wow, what do Christians do on vacation? I haven't got a clue what they do. 
Because I used to get, I'm away from home, away from my parents. We got up to outrageous stuff. My guy, my friends, we go off, oh, terrible things, terrible things. Now, I'm a Christian. What do you do on holiday as a Christian? And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go to the Keswick Convention. I mean, I mean, how holy can you get? I thought, I'll, I'll go to Keswick. And because I'd heard of that famous convention, I thought, well, I'm going to go. I mean, that, what do Christians do on the holidays? I'll go to Keswick. And uh, so, I mean, I've got my scooter. That's what I've got. So I say to my friend, come with me to Keswick. Yes, yeah, go. So we go to Keswick on my scooter. And I mean, scooters, as you know, they're for driving around town. And I thought, well, I've never been anywhere else around Brighton, really, but let's go. So my friend gets on the back, and off we go. And I'm off, I'm off up to London, Hyde Park Corner. I said, before motorways, I go back a long way. I go through the London, Hyde Park Corner. Oh, it's wonderful. I'm driving through London, wow, traffic. I'm through London, out the other side, and uh, up the A5, we're going to the A5. Oh, we're going to the A5, and we're having a fun old time. And uh, the Peak District, you know the Peak District? And uh, we're going up to the Peak District, and the sky starts looking very dark over here. Well, I'm not into helmets. I mean, helmets are not cool, and you didn't have to wear helmets in those days. And I'm not into leather or anything like that. So I don't have any gloves or helmet. Just a short sleeve shirt and, you know, what's going on? I'm on the scooter, and it, it comes... What is that? That's like, that doesn't look very friendly. And we're on, the, we're on this peak district. I mean, it's bleak. There's nothing there. There's nowhere to hide. Nowhere to go. It's just over the hills. Up over this one. Next one. Over we go. Over the peak district. And suddenly, rain. Wow. It hits us. I mean, pouring, pouring rain. I think, Lord, what are you doing? And this is my holy pilgrimage. Can't you look after me better than this? And this honestly happened. The rain turned to hail. And it's like every dagger is in my... Ow, 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 ow. And my hands, ouch, it hurts. Ow, ow, ow. And these, ow, this is bad news. God, hey, I'm on a pilgrimage to Keswick. Come on. And, and do you know, this is what literally happened to me. I thought, what about Jesus' hands? It just came to me. What about his hands? It's really hurting my hands. I mean, these horrible, horrible hailstones. I thought, what about his hands? And I thought, and it's in my face. I thought, what about his head? As that crown crushed into it, I put it on him and then beat him. And I, it just came to me. I thought, oh, Lord. It's like Moses. He suddenly saw a tree. And I suddenly, I shouted to my friend on the back, what about Jesus' hands? What about his face? And you have to shout because the motor's roaring and the wind's blowing and rain. What about Jesus? And we start singing. Literally. We say, Jesus, you're wonderful, Jesus. I can't remember those old songs, but we're singing about Jesus. And we just, honestly, this, the bitterness became sweet. We just, we just, Lord, you're amazing that you endured all that for me. That you should go through that, your iso utter isolation. No answer from heaven. Not like Stephen when he's dying, I see the heavens open. Jesus saw nothing, darkness. A father forsaking him, turned away. That no one's no loneliness like he knew. No one's like agony like he knew. It's not a holy thing, it's not at the temple, it's not on the trash heap. He's dying alone. You see, you put the cross in it. And you find Jesus. You get a revelation of his love. You learn more in bitter seasons very often than you would learn anywhere else. You really do. I was once in China smuggling Bibles. A couple of friends. We were in Shanghai. And a small hotel room. And we were delivering Bibles to a pastor. And this wonderful old pastor came to us. Little room. We were sitting on the bed with no chairs. He sat on the floor, back to the wall. And I said, tell me your story. He came to collect the Bibles from us. I said, tell me your story. He said, when I was 44, they took me. He's got a wife and six kids. His name was Alan Ewan. And he said, they took me away when I was 44. And 21 years later, not 21 days, or months even, 21 years later, later, 
when he was 65, they thought he's finished, put him out. 21 years. I mean, we've had five kids, you know, watching them grow. He didn't see them grow at all. His wife was proposed to by godly Christian men who said, let us marry you, care for you, care for your children. And she said, no, he could still be alive. He may be alive. And she waited. And when he was 65, they threw him out. And he's back with her. And when he came to visit us, he was like 81, 82, absolutely bright and radiant. I read some weeks, well, I think probably months later when I came back to England, I saw a Christian magazine about the Far East, Alan Ewan under house arrest for baptizing 400 people one day. They thought he was finished. He's an amazing guy. And I said to him, you have suffered so much. And I'll never forget his answer. I can still see his face. He said, nothing compares with the cross. Not a trace of bitterness. Not a trace. He didn't say, oh, I could tell you some. No, no, no. He was just shining and bright. Got your Bibles. What a victory. Beloved, that's the victory. We sing about the victory. That victory in life. Finding Jesus really saves us. Why did that happen to me? They let me down. I thought, hey, beloved, that's not getting saved. We're saved by Jesus. And, and we throw the cross into the bitterness. You've done that? So, well, no, you've got to do it. You have to do it. You have to work out your salvation. Otherwise, you're not living a saved life. You know, you're saved then, you're going to be saved one day, and you live in pro tem atheism. You have to live with Jesus and the victory of the cross. And you find Jesus draws near. And he saves you. He changes it. He just comes and transforms you into joy. When I think of myself sitting at home that night and think, I'm going to die. I've got nothing to live for. I had no idea what God had planned. The, the wonderful joys, incredible life that he got to give me. All I thought was it's loss. Jesus has got life for us. But the journey is a tough journey sometimes. Sometimes there are shocking, bitter experiences that we never anticipated. And it's suddenly on you. We have to learn to throw the cross into it. We have to learn, now Jesus, you're enough for me. You saved me, you rescued me. You find if we went on to the end of the chapter, which we didn't, then they came to 12 springs, Elim. Yeah, just around the corner was wonderful provision. But they learned to know God in the bitterness. Let me just close in prayer and encourage you. Let's do that. Shall we? Let's just pray. Lord, I, just, I do pray for my dear friends here this morning. Lord, you know far better than I how hard life has been for some. Or how our hopes were dashed. Our expectations taken from us. Lord, we, we just acknowledge the reality of it. We think of our dear friends in Ukraine. We think of, Lord, all that they're experiencing. I thank you for news from people like Andrei Bondarenko and others who are triumphing in it. Lord, we know that they're applying the cross. And Father, I just ask you right now, let us know your presence. Can we just stand, please? I just want to pray. Just, just lift your face to God. And sometimes we're told to bow in prayer. I want, to, I want to encourage you, lift your face to God. Father, I ask you right now for the coming of your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the wonders of the cross. The amazing degree to which you committed yourself to us. Come, Holy Spirit. Maybe you want to put your hands out like you're receiving a tray or something. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and rest on them, Lord. Come now, Holy Spirit. 
Help us to see you, Jesus, to receive your mercy. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name. What a triumphant Savior. Come to us, Lord. Help us, each one of us, to work out our salvation in life. Not to be stoical, not just to grit our teeth, but to meet Jesus and be wonderfully helped. Come upon us, Lord. Bless us as we sing your praise together, even now, that we might understand what a wonderful Savior you are. In Jesus' name, amen.